After seven long years of waiting, we finally have the reveal of what Invisible Girl truly looks like. Not to mention the reactions of the entire 1A class once they too discovered the identity of the UA traitor. With the previous chapter, Deku and Bakugo train together as we received an explanation of his newfound upgrade to his power known as Cluster. What is essentially the saving of several spheres of sweat for even more devastating explosions. For the sake of which he has chosen to continue wearing his winter costume despite reaching exhaustion sooner. Meanwhile, Shoto had now achieved the equilibrium between his fire and ice sides and was now striving to make his body resistant against his elder brother's flames. We finally found out whatever happened to Giganto Makia as apparently he had remained sedated and bound since the end of the war, so he is unlikely to be a problem again. Now they haven't killed him, so it's not as if they are completely disregarding their laws and legislation. And I don't doubt that they could kill him if they really wanted to, considering his vulnerability to ingestion. But even still, their victory was far from assured, all things considered, as the likelihood of them finding all for one prior to the impending battles was unrealistic. This time around, they would have half of the previous forces, meanwhile Shigaraki would be complete. And lastly, as opposed to the heroes managing to get the jump on the villains like during the war, this time around, the villains would decide the commencement. However, it was Deku's belief that they would still have the opportunity to decide how they enter the fight. Which was all the more reason for Deku to desire rejoining the search. And thanks to Uraraka's speech, tensions between the heroes and evacuees had largely settled, making a bit of a stroll outside for Deku pretty much harmless. From there, we found ourselves with Invisible Girl within the forest that surrounds Yue. According to her, since the war and even despite Deku's return to the school, one of their classmates has yet to smile or be their usual self, and so concerned she went looking for him. And what she discovered was utterly heartbreaking as Yuga Oyama, while speaking to her incessant parents, was in fact revealed to be the UA traitor. As it turns out, Yuga had been working for All For One even before he entered UA, and had recently been tasked with a new mission which he was presently finding difficulties with. We even find out that like Deku, Oyama was born quirkless and in fear of his difference was brought to All For One who bestowed onto him his naval laser quirk, but in exchange had certain obligations to fulfill, which he absolutely could not avoid otherwise his family would be slaughtered by the villain. And while all this information was divulged, to emerge would be Deku having been led by Invisible Girl. In fact, he also shared the very same intentions as Invisible Girl as he had recognized Oyama to have been uncharacteristically glum recently. And so he went out to find him as Yuga, with tears flooding his face, would admit to Deku that he is, in fact, a despicable villain. With this latest chapter, we return to the hideaway of the villains as Dobby recognizes All For One's sentiment about the possession of friends. However, he is somewhat concerned that the discovery of such a friend would prove unfavorable for them. However, All For One felt no such way and likens the situation to one where a cheap lighter stops working. If their little trader does his job, wonderful. If not, oh well. Throw him out and move on to the next plan. All for one truly possesses an utter disregard for all life that is not useful to his own, and toys with the lives of others like a game. Oyama and his family meant nothing to all for one beyond simply being disposable pawns for his own use. However, he certainly wasn't opposed to being entertained. But now back to the forest, Oyama's parents would grab him and urge their son to flee. As Oyama puts it, in the past, both were very concerned with his quirklessness. They were both from exceedingly wealthy families, and so they were able to raise their boy with all the luxuries and privileges one could possibly desire, which is why the prospect of their son being regarded as different or less than was so terrifying. They were willing to do any and everything for the sake of his happiness. As such, upon coming across the rumor that someone was able to give quirks to others, they jumped at the opportunity. And even when it was discovered that Aoyama's quirk was incompatible with his body, they still spared no expense to make things work as they had commissioned the very belt he wears to this day, which allowed their son to embark on his journey and dream, to become a hero that shows both sympathy and compassion. And so yeah, their reasoning for getting involved in all this was pure. But just as life was looking to be on the up and up, suddenly, Oyama received a telepathic message from One For All himself. According to a rumor, All Might was set to become a teacher at UA, and so Ayama was to immediately enroll. 
which simultaneously provided us confirmation that All for One is able to communicate with those he has bestowed quirks onto remotely, which is insane. Now, once Yuga was in UA, he would continue to be instructed by the villain. He was to tell All for One when the class was isolated, which caused the USJ incident. He was made to say where the training camp was taking place, which led to the abduction of Bakugo and Ragdoll, a circumstance which subsequently brought about All Might's battle against All for One at Kamino, and the villain's possession of the search quirk, bringing a definitive end to the reign of the symbol of peace, creating a false sense of comfort on account of the King of the Underworld's incarceration, and overall sowing the seeds of what would gradually lead to the war arc. And most recently, Yugo was instructed to lure out and isolate Deku now that he has returned to Yue. In the present, Yugo would speak once more to Deku, this time talking to him about the letter he had made for everyone when he left the school. As just then, Deku's danger sense would kick in. Oyama now crying out would begin to attack, telling Deku that when he found out that he was born quirkless too, he fell into the deepest pits of despair. These two certainly did not want to fight one another, but Oyama felt he had no other choice to protect his family, and so they would both brace themselves as Oyama would fire. But leaping to the defense of Deku, it would be Invisible Girl who would manage to redirect the blast entirely as her body has the ability to warp light. She too would now speak to Oyama, but certainly with a tone unlike Deku's. She'd begin yelling at him, saying that they all could have died, that their country has now been thrown into chaos, as just then, we receive a glimpse of her face as she wept, baffled by the fact that Oyama had the nerve to sit in the same classroom as all of them, that he had the nerve to sleep in the same dorm as all of them, a sentiment that rocked Oyama to his core, as his guilt was far too much to bear. Horikoshi finally managed to find a way to reveal this character's face. A conundrum he had considered really early on with the story, and yes, Invisible Girl's costume is her birthday suit with boots and gloves, so if you can see her, you can see a whole lot of her. However, her appearance here is largely obscured with slightly vague features, so she's not entirely visible. And I say this to express that they probably didn't get flashed or anything here. Not exactly something we usually address, but I know a lot of people are bound to consider it. But anyways, before you Yuga's parents could come to his defense, in an instant Deku, using Black Whip, was able to apprehend the entire family simultaneously. Deku would then express to Yuga that Invisible Girl had done this to prevent him from hurting anyone else, now asking for them to put an end to all of this here and now. We would then fast forward to the entire family being restrained as several faculty members, students, and police officers are present. The expression on All Might's face was heart-wrenching. They had concluded that because Yuga received his quirk 10 years ago and was fine even now despite being discovered, it was unlikely that it possessed the same explosive mechanism that Lady Nagans did. Now, Principal Nezu would urge these students to step away from everything, but they refused to do so as they were all experiencing a sea of emotions. Ojiro would then console his crush Invisible Girl as he questioned what Yugo would have done had he not been caught. My boy Kirishima would then chime in begging Oyama to say that none of it is true. Bakugo would mention the familiarity of a quirkless kid being provided a quirk by someone else as Deku was silent and Oyama's eyes would not face his classmates. True Man would question the family as to all that they knew about All for One as per protocol, but again, they were nothing more than pawns and did not know a thing, only what he had instructed them to do, that if they failed or lied, they would be killed, a truth they knew all too well on account of what he had shown them, examples of people he had discarded like trash, that if you tried to tell others, he would have you killed the very moment you left your home, no matter where you went, he would know, and death would soon follow. Yuga's father would then vouch for his son and shift the blame onto his foolish parents as Oyama only knew not to get caught. Meanwhile for Oyama, the words of Invisible Girl continued to ring through his head. He would now finally speak, that despite being surrounded by all the people that could have been killed because of him, he had the nerve to hang out with them and pretend to be one of them, that seeing Deku a formerly quirkless person like himself actually stand up against All for One caused him such despair. But what's worse is that even while Deku was so severely burdened, all Oyama could think about was his own pain, 
which made him realize that he was truly rotten to his core. That Oyama Yuga is a villain through and through. As suddenly Deku would interject, questioning why Yuga tried saving Bakugo and Tokoyami during the training camp. He would think back to the cheese Oyama had previously laid out for him, what he now realizes to have been a cry for help, that the reason Oyama is crying now isn't because he failed all for one. He would then think back to Lady Nagan, who was also made to be a pawn by all for one. Yet despite having her mind ruined, she never lost her spirit. Deku's true regret here was not realizing sooner. All Might would look to his young protege as Deku would boldly proclaim that nobody should be labeled a villain for the rest of their lives simply because they committed a crime. He would then offer Oyama's hand as Bakugo would think back to Deku's prior statement about them deciding how they entered the battle, questioning to himself if this was the sort of tactic Deku had in mind, followed by Deku crying out to Oyama that he can still become a hero. Now Deku offering his hand to Yuga here is pretty interesting considering he is literally in restraints right now, but sure. Deku's sentiment about the label of villainy isn't exactly something I can agree with wholeheartedly. I can understand reform and repentance to a degree, sure, but it's a very shonen sort of outlook that isn't all too applicable outside of this series, which is somewhat limited by how horrendous crimes can actually be. Very curious what you guys may think about Deku's talk no jutsu here. However, Deku urging Oyama that he can still be a hero is a major development for his character, as this is the very same thing he had once been told by All Might when he was quirkless, which changed his life forever. To now be in the position where he can do the very same thing is tremendous. And Bakugo too seems to have adopted the ways of his master, as if you noticed, with how he now wears his winter costume, which seems as though it will be his primary costume for the remainder of the series, is rather reminiscent to the mouth covering attire of Best Genus. It is truly remarkable how much of an impact such an unlike figure has had on Bakugo. And at that, Bakugo seems to be reading between the lines about Deku's intentions here, but more than anything else, to me, it seems like Deku just refuses to give up on a friend. And honestly, with such an impossible situation like Oyama's and the clear signs of regret he had expressed, it makes a whole lot of sense why he would be willing to resolve things like this. Yet at the same time, trust is an exceedingly difficult thing to restore for some more than others. Even if Deku manages to forgive him, who is to say that the entirety of the class will be able to feel the very same way. After all, Oyama is partly responsible for some of the most traumatic moments of their young lives, along with, of course, the realization of his deception being an especially violating thought. But if you have even just one thought of relief, it should be that when it comes to bringing you some of the best My Hero Academia content on the platform, Plot Armor has you covered. As always, I'm Slice of Otaku. Thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.